There you go. I could listen to you read the entire thing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that is so much fun. And the accent and it's just perfection. <laughs> You're listening to the Read Aloud Revival Podcast. This is the podcast that helps you make meaningful and lasting connections with your kids through books. Hello, friends. Oh, boy, do I have a fun episode for you today. Welcome to the Read Aloud Revival, episode 59. I'm your host, Sarah McKenzie. Now, first of all, it's the end of February. Can I get a hip hip (laughs) sound off around here? I am always so happy to see winter come to an end here in the inland Northwest. And this last winter has been an especially cold and snowy one. So hello, March, in like a lion, you come. (laughs) Today, I've got a fabulous guest interview with Mary Rose Wood, author of the Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place books. It's a whole series Just wait till you hear her reading at the very end of today's episode. There's howling involved. It is utterly fantastic. (laughs) I know you'll love it. If you love Mary Rose Wood today, you're in for a treat because your kids can meet her at a Read Aloud Revival Author Access event. She'll be joining us live for a video stream in membership where she'll take questions from your kids and answer them live on screen. You know about those author access events, right? Our next one is coming up here with Patricia Polacco. That will be followed by the one and only Tommy DePaola in Read Aloud Revival membership. The good news is we'll be opening membership at the end of March. Doors have been closed for a few months now, but we're getting ready to open them up for just 10 days of registration. When you're a member, one of the many benefits is that your kids can meet their favorite and your favorite authors and illustrators like Tommy DePaola, Marla Frazee, Grace Lynn, Andrew Peterson, Jane Yolen, and today's guest, Mary Rosewood. Your kids can type their questions in on the author who's live on the video stream answers them. It is just really fantastic. We'll give you a little peek into what those look like pretty soon here on the podcast. If you want to be first to know when those membership doors open, you want to head to rarmembership.com and put your email into the page there so you don't miss our announcement. After this upcoming registration period, we won't be opening doors again for a while, so you definitely don't want to miss it. That's rarmembership.com to get on the waiting list so you know when doors are open. Now, let's get on to today's show. I know you're going to love it. Have you ever asked yourself, maybe in a particularly challenging parenting moment, were these children raised by wolves? That's the exact question Mary Rose Wood asked herself just a few years ago, and it led to a wonderful, funny series of books about a governess and her charges that is filled with adventure and plenty of pluck. Mary Rose Wood has been an actor, a director, a playwright, and a comedian. Her work as a playwright made her a three-time winner of the prestigious Richard Rogers Award, administered by the American Academy of Arts and Letters. The Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place is her first series for middle grade readers. It's one of my favorite new finds, and the series itself has won numerous awards. In fact, book number five, The Unmapped Sea, was named a Best Children's Book of 2015 by NPR. Mary Rose teaches fiction writing at NYU and loves to speak to young readers and writers at schools. We are so excited she's here to join us today. Mary Rose, welcome to the Read Aloud Revival. Thank you so much, Sarah. I'm so thrilled to be here. Well, I have been excited for weeks to talk to you because your series, The Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place, is one of my absolute favorites. I just stumbled upon it in the last several months and completely delightful. So I'm really excited to chat with you about the books today. Oh, thank you so much. Yes, the the books have been around for a few years, the most recent book that was published was book five in the series. So so they've been really kind of building a readership and people are still discovering the series and which is very exciting to me. Oh, I think the listeners to this podcast in particular are going to love them. And I think they'll find out why by the time we're done (laughs) talking about them today. Do you want to tell us before we start talking about the books? Do you want to tell us a little more about your family? Uh, Sure. So I have two wonderful, largely grown children 
it really does fly by. I'm sure everyone out there who has kids is discovering this for themselves. But my baby is 18 years old and my firstborn is 21. So I am, you know, really a beautiful threshold in my parenting career of, you know, letting the chicks fly out of the nest and Mm -hmm. supporting them as they become young adults. So that's my family life. And I am a full-time writer and working on the final book in the series right now and starting to cook up some projects for what comes next. Ah, that was one of my questions. The sixth book is going to be the final book in the series then. Yes. It's a series that is kind of each book, you know, you can read them on their own, but it really tells a kind of continuous tale. So my wish was to really be able to provide a big, satisfying conclusion to all the readers. And so I'm calling an end to the proceedings by saying, no, book six, we're going to wrap up mysteries and have a big, you know, kind of climactic ending. So it will be the end. I'll call it the end of this narrative thread, you know, the end of this plot. But that's not to say that there might not be other books written about these characters or in this world in the future. I'd sort of love them too much to rule that out. Well, I think when I come to the end, I have not actually come to the end of the fifth book yet, but when I do, when I come to the end of the sixth book, I know I'm going to be sad to say goodbye to Penelope Lumley because she is completely delightful. (laughs) So how about for our readers who are not familiar with your books, do you want to give them the premise, sort of the overall, just like lay the foundation so they know what we're talking about? Sure. So The Incorrigible Children of Ashton Place is the name of the series. And in the first book, which is called The Mysterious Howling, we meet Miss Penelope Lumley, who is 15 years old and a recent graduate of the Swanburn Academy for Poor Bright Females. She's on her way to her first job interview, which it will be as a governess. The entire series is set in Victorian England. And you know, being a governess was one of the very few jobs that a respectable, educated young lady, you know, was suitable for. So she's on her way to her first job interview at this mysterious, very grand state called Ashton Place. And when she gets there, she meets the very, very nervous and flighty lady of the house, Lady Constance. And after a brief interview is offered the job on the spot. However, nobody will answer any of her questions about the children who are you know, sort of the main part of being a governess. But she takes the job, and only after she signs a contract, binding contract of employment, does she herself discover that the three children that she has been hired to care for and educate were actually raised by wolves. <laughs> so, and they are delightful and prove to be very adept pupils, but she has to really change as we do when we work with children. She has to really adapt her plan, her preconceived notion about what she was going to do to the children's needs. So she sort of has to put aside for a little bit, you know, the lessons in French and watercolor painting and rules of lawn tennis and rudiments of first aid and sort of focus on the essentials, which is, you know, eating cooked food and learning to wear clothes. And most importantly of all, just sort of stop chasing squirrels <laughs> when they fly because, you know, the children are very easily distracted <laughs> by small, tasty rodents. So, There's something metaphorical there, I think, that all the parents <laughs> listening right now can <laughs> understand. Well, you know, who hasn't ever, you know, had that moment where you're looking at your own child with this sense of, what are you? <laughs> Exactly. What kind of creature are you? And how can I bridge the gap and communicate what I really need you to know through this, you know, wild exterior? But uh, so that's sort of the the fun premise. But, you know, needless to say, the children are are really quite special and have very good hearts and very adaptable and, and eager to be taught. And Penelope, who has herself been raised at this very special boarding school, it's not an unsavory place at all. It's not like a Dickensian, you know, negative experience. It's an almost utopian society of, you know, where girls are really treated with respect and taught to be filled with optimism and pluck and are guided by the, you know, the wise sayings of the school's founder, Agatha Swanburn. And so she leaves this very upbeat place, you know, with a kind of wonderful, positive naivete and a real moral center. And It's this quality. These are the resources that she has that she brings to bear in her experiences with the children. And then the larger frame, which is that, you know, these kids were left in the woods by someone for some reason. And so alongside this sort of My Fair Lady plot of her 
sort of teaching them how to behave more like children and less, less like wolf cubs, the mystery of who they really are and why they were left in the woods and by whom, you know, for what purpose starts to come to the fore. And as the series progresses, you know, she realizes that there's quite a dark little, you know, mystery and danger that she's got to address in order to make things end happily for all of them. Okay, so tell me where the idea for this series first came from. Where did it all start? When I was a nerdy bookworm teenager, (laughs) as I assume that many of your listeners have been as well. (laughs) My my tribe, uh, my (laughs) favorite book that I read over and over again, and I still uh, reread it every year, was Jane Eyre, of Mm. course. Mm -hmm. I mean, a great Victorian governess novel. You know, there are several great Victorian governess novels, but that was the one I absolutely fell in love with. And it was the kind of reading experience for me that I would finish Jane Eyre you know, I would just savor the last page and I would close the book and I would hug it to my heart, you know, close my eyes, take that breath. And then I would go back to the beginning and start reading it over again because oh, wow. you don't want to leave that book. You know, it's like the beloved fictional world that you just don't want to leave. So I was very enamored with Victorian British literature and I was very besotted with the kind of character that Jane was. And I'm sure many of your listeners know Jane Eyre well, but you know, if you don't, Jane, like Penelope Lumley in my own books, is an orphan who was uh, raised with no advantages. You know, she's got this very difficult upbringing, she's raised by a family that doesn't treat her well, and she's sent to a difficult place and to go to school, and she ends up getting a job as a governess. And, you know, she's got no resources except what is inside her. It's her integrity, her character her smarts, her creativity, her intuition, it's her, all of her resources are internal. And she's very true to herself. She's the sort of role model for pluck and integrity. And she's a young woman and she stands up to power fearlessly. I, mean, I just thought she was just the bomb, as we say nowadays. And I thought how great it would be to write a character with those qualities, you know, to invent someone who had that kind of substance. And yet I'm a clown, you know, I'm a, I love comedy. And I was playing with this idea of Victorian governesses, but I was simultaneously very intrigued by what you could do to turn that on its head. And um, when my son was very small boy, his favorite book, one of his favorite books for me to read aloud to him at night was uh, Curious George. And we all love Curious George, but the process of Curious George, who's sort of a monkey but he's sort of a little boy. <laughs> yeah, very, exactly. It's just strange. It's got this kind of surreal imaginative leap that we can kind of hold Curious George in our heads as a, both a monkey and a small child at the same time. And because he's a monkey, he does these ridiculously chaotic, you know, mayhem inducing things. But because he's also a little boy, he's always forgiven and loved and everything turns out well. And my son loved this. You know, you don't have to be, I think, a that have a PhD in psychology to understand the appeal to a small child that <laughs> terror, you, know, you could just cause a mess and yet it's all going to be okay. And you'll always be forgiven. So I also had this fascination with the notion of children who inhabited this, you know, gray area between animal and child <laughs> and, and that there was this possibility for extreme behavior, but that they were so good at heart. And so that became the inspiration for the incorrigibles themselves. So we're raised by wolves. And so you know, they just go wild sometimes, you know, <laughs> they bay at the moon and climb on the furniture and, you know, chase little animals. But they're also so sweet. And putting those two very unlike ideas together was kind of the creative act. And, you know, once I did that, then all of the possibilities of, well, well, how would this, you know, what would happen and all the questions that rose from the premise itself led me to the story. So you have two children who, uh, I think on your website, you described them when they were younger as two curious and occasionally rambunctious pupils yourself. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you homeschooled a bit, right? I did. I did. When my children were quite young, we homeschooled up through the time that my daughter was old enough to enter sixth grade, which was middle school in the community that we were living in. So she never attended elementary school at all. And her younger brother was homeschooled. And then when she went to school, he wanted to go to school too. So they started in third grade and in sixth grade. 
But that gave us, you know, a nice homeschooling experience when they were young. And I have to say, it is so, to me, so present in these books because my experience of being around young children was always enmeshed with finding the teachable moments and, you know, the process of learning and noticing the world around us. That was our family life. It wasn't separated at all from the idea of education. And it's exactly the relationship that Penelope has with the incorrigibles. And so I get to relive that pleasure, you know, in writing these books. Well, I think that's maybe partly the reason I fell in love with Penelope Lumley so quickly. I mean, of course, I think it's almost impossible not to (laughs) when you're reading these books. But especially when I'm talking to other homeschoolers, I always want to say, no, you particularly will adore these books. And I couldn't really put my finger on it. And it wasn't until our podcast manager, Kara, told me that you had homeschooled for a few years that I thought, ah, that makes sense. (laughs) Well, and the truth is, of course, Penelope's 15. Now she's a Victorian 15, which means that she's got to go out and support herself, but she's a child herself. So what you have here is, you know, really a group of four children who are in love with learning. And the eldest among them is, you know, taken on the role of educator and kind of substitute mom. But mm-hmm. it's all, you know, it's it's coming from such a loving place. And she, of course, learns as much from the children as they learn from her, which is always the case when you teach. Okay, so Agatha Swanburn, the founder of the academy that Penelope Lumley grew up at, really, right? Right. Mm-hmm. So she's sort of known for always having just the right words at any given time. And every time we come across another little saying of hers, I think, how on earth does the author come up with these completely perfect, delightful little sayings? So tell me about that. Well, first of all, that's very flattering. Uh, Thank you. It's quite a challenge to set for oneself. I call this throwing your backpack over the fence. You know, it's like if you throw your backpack over the fence, you're going to have to learn how to climb that fence and go get it. So when you create a character who is known for her ability to, you know, to come up with these memorable, pithy, wise sayings that kind of become the, you know, moral code of a whole community of school girls. It's like, well, now you've got to think of them. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) At school, you know, they're often quoted. Penelope, whenever she gets herself into a pickle, you know, she's like, well, you know, what would Agatha Swanberg do? She's often really kind of coming up with these sayings to inspire herself, you know, to say, you know, what do I know? What was I taught? How can I make a good decision now? At the Swanburn School, the sayings are embroidered onto countless pillows that are (laughs) scattered all over the school. I mean, it's really embedded in the culture of the Swanburn Academy. And so from my perspective, what I have learned to do over the course of the books is to not worry about coming up with them in the abstract, but to tell the story of what happens to these characters and to remind myself whenever they are in a tough spot, they can rely on the wisdom of Agatha Swanburn. And I just, I sort of join them in saying, well, what would Agatha Swanburn say right now? You know, what advice is most needed? And from that question, usually the right Agatha Swanburn saying will present itself at least in its meaning, you know, in the good advice that is needed. You know, I'll draft something that will be the advice that they need. But then the work comes in because then I have to really boil it down into something that's kind of catchy. Yes, exactly. The pithy. (laughs) People Mm -hmm. who are advertising get paid so much money because to get to the pithy, you know, catchy, memorable part takes a lot of revision. But that really, you know, that's where the fun comes in. It almost reminds me just a little bit. Have you read Alexander McCall Smith's number one ladies detective agency books? I have not. Okay. In what, in what way is it similar? Well, Ma Ramotswe, who is the main character of the leading detective in the agency, she depends on this book. And I'm, I'm just like beating my head against a wall over here trying to remember the author of the book that she basically read a book on being a detective and then started this whole agency based on her reading of this book. <laughs> And she quotes him and his, I don't know that his sayings are quite as pithy or just catchy and perfect as Agatha Swanburn's, but she relies on these little pieces of truth, I guess, that she read in this book. And then it informs the whole way she's going to act and sets the stage for the next, how she's going to deal with the predicament. It just kind of reminded me of that. I just love it so much, but I always think, goodness, that must be so hard to So that's really fun to hear you talk about how it just has to kind of present itself at the right time. They rise out of the story. You know, they just rise out of the story. And then I have to really boil them down. And it is actually a lot of fun. And what you're describing, 
in this other book. It's such a treat for an author of this temperament, you know, of my temperament, who likes to sort of play with literary ideas, you know, like playing with the idea of a Victorian governess and then sort of mushing it together with, you know, like the Jungle Book, you know, Mm -hmm. it's it's sort of consciously playing with literary ideas that you're fond of. The idea of inventing a fictional work of fiction and embedding it in the novel that you're writing, it to me is just like dessert, you know, it's so fun. And so to invent Agatha Swanburne and her entire body of sayings, and I've had many people, you know, send me emails or fan mail saying, where can I get the book of Agatha Swanburne sayings, you know, as if she's a real person, you know, that it's some one of the little known European philosophers, you know, and and that's, which is great fun. But I also invented a series of books called Giddy Up Rainbow, that was my, you know, to amuse myself invention of the kind of horse books that I loved as a kid. And so there's a a fictional series within the Incorrigible Children books that's Penelope's favorite series of books to read. And so I, you know, nothing makes me happier than inventing a new title (laughs) for one of the Giddy Up Rainbow (laughs) books, you know, it's great fun to put to, you know, it's like Russian nesting dolls, you know, to put your fictional creations within fictional creations. It's almost like you're tucking little secrets, like your own little inside jokes into your book. I love it. That's <laughs> so fun. I was actually going to ask you about Giddy Up Rainbow because I think so many of us as kids and so many of our young listeners and readers in our families go through series like that, that they keep with them forever or that really shape them or that inform them throughout their life. What did you like to read most as a child? What were your favorites growing up? Well, I mean, I'll tell you, Giddy Up Rainbow, though, is a kind of a classic girl and horse friendship series. And those books are still popular. And I absolutely adored Black Beauty, another great Victorian novel. And I read all of the horse books of the Black Stallion books and my friend Flicka. I mean, I read a lot of them. And I was a suburban kid, you know, growing up out on Long Island, which is a, you know, suburb of New York City. I'd never been near a horse. I mean, I had the idea of me and a horse ever being, you know, in the same proximity to each other was just ludicrous. But (laughs) somehow I was obsessed with horses. And my daughter went through a similar phase, you know, and she was a New York City kid. And I just thought it was sort of fascinating. So that was the, the giddy up rainbow inspiration. But when I was a kid, I have to say, I recently found, uh, this is a little digression, but I'm going to answer your question. I moved recently. And so there was a lot of packing and unpacking and going through things. And I found a book that I read that was my constant companion as a kid. And it's just one of those uh, golden collections of children's literature. I think it's Louis Untermeyer collection, golden treasury of children's literature. And the spine was cracked. You know, I mean, it was this big, thick book. And I realized, oh my God, I just read this book constantly. And I opened it up to remind myself what was in it. And it was filled with British children's literature. It had stories from, just so stories by Richard Kipling. It had Beatrix Potter stories. It had Lewis Carroll in it, and it had, you know, lots of kind of stalwart epic poetry, (laughs) you know, about shipwrecks and things like that. And I really had to laugh because so much of the sensibility and the even the ear for language that I now employ is just between the hardcovers of this particular anthology. So I have to laugh how much one probably I don't even know where that book came from. Maybe my mom got it for me or maybe someone gave it to us as a gift but how one book could have such a firm thumbprint on your sensibilities. Without uh, you even really really knowing, right? Because it's kind of subconscious. I just loved it. I just loved reading all this old old timey stuff. And it really made an impression on me. So that was that. Jane Eyre was the book of my adolescence. I went through a serious obsession with The Wrinkle in Time, which is a fine, enduring, you know, (laughs) middle grade classic. Yes. And in fact, when I taught writing children's fiction to my college age students. I always make them read A Wrinkle in Time because I think it's a very interesting work, very individualistic, you know, quirky vision and how enduring it is, you know, how a book that so of its time, you know, it's written in the early 60s and has all this stuff in it about, you know, very related to the politics of the time, the Cold War and the fear of the Soviet Union and all this stuff. But how it just manages to be enduringly compelling. It's still powerful and people still love it and it still is read by kids today. That's right. (music) 
my daughter, my 13 year old especially, just adored. I think she read A Wrinkle in Time maybe a year, maybe two years ago, the whole series. And just, I've only read the first, but she just adored them. So, and I know that was one of my mom's favorites when she was a kid too. So, okay. So I'm really curious about writing a series like this that's packed with, you know, puzzles and clues and mystery, really. How did you keep track of things? Do you outline ahead of time? Do you know where the story is going or it's going to end? Do you know how it's going to wrap up or how do you kind of do that? It's such a good question. <laughs> I laugh ruefully, pulling out my hair. It's a very, it's very hard to do. It would be great. You know, I, I'm a fan of Game of Thrones. I read the first couple of books and and then became exhausted, but, you know, been watching it on HBO. And I understand that George Martin has such a, you know, a, a core group of devoted fans that they do all of the cataloging of, you know, plot and world building for him, you know, that he can always go to his <laughs> readers and say, hey, wait a minute. What did I say 3,000 pages ago about right. this? Remind me. I would be great if I had a little team of astute fifth graders, you know, <laughs> living with me. Exactly. But since I don't, and my dog and my two cats are useless on this account, <laughs> I have, I just keep a lot of files on my computer and it's very primitive system of organization. There's a lot of software tools and things like that that are designed to help writers do stuff like this, but I don't know how to use any of them. So I just use Microsoft Word. And whenever I do some research, which is all the time, because I'm not a historian and I always have to look things up about, you know, what kind of trains and sailing ships and how far cities were from each other and Mm. clothing that people would wear. I mean, all of the details that you need to know to create a plausible historical environment. You know, I've got to look it up all the time. So when I look stuff up, I copy and paste and I grab images and I just create a document and I'll name it, whatever it is, whether it's, you know, what kind of food was served at okay. a dinner or, you know, what was the fanciest hotel and, you know, in a particular city in a particular year and or what was playing on the West End in London, you know, during a particular mm-hmm. time. So I just have lots and lots of Microsoft Word files that are have labels on them. And that's where a lot of my research is. And then I, I use a lot of the comment feature in Microsoft Word as well. And unfortunately, you know, as I write, I can really get bogged down with going back and looking things up all the time. So instead of actually doing that, I, <laughs> I just put a little comment, check this, check this, check this against book three. What did you say in book four? You know, I just, just sort of I berate myself in the margins. So that um, it doesn't slow down your storytelling, basically. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. I, you know, sometimes I have to go back and look because I, I can't remember who found out what when. And I have to go back and look, but then I'll grab it and I'll stick it in the margin. So, you know, it's just, I just have this kind of constant dialogue with myself and use files and the margin comments to kind of keep track either of what I've already looked up or what I I haven't yet looked up. But you're absolutely right. You know, to write a single plot with multiple characters and a central mystery arc that's the length of six fairly chunky novels there's way more stuff than I could hold in my head. Do you know when you're starting on a new one where it's going to end and where you're going, kind of the big points along the way, or do those come arise as you're writing? Well, it's a combination of knowing and not knowing. Mm-hmm. And that to me is a pretty good description of the creative process. <laughs> you have to know enough, as Tolkien wisely wrote in The Hobbit, enough to get on with. You have to know enough to get on with. And I've been a writer for many, many years, and I'm a firm believer in story structure. My first training as a writer was not as a novelist, but as a playwright. And so I sort of started with the basics, you know, Aristotle's poetics, beginning, middle and end. (laughs) This is how you write a story. And it's very good advice. And, you know, it, it never hurts to follow it. So I feel that I know, and by beginning, middle and end, I sort of know what the initial problem is. And I usually have had a sense of where the world of adventure is going to be, because most stories, the hero or the protagonist, you know, sort of moves from where they are in the beginning to some large arena of adventure, which is, you know, maybe they've gone off to a different location, like Dorothy leaving Kansas and going to Oz, or maybe they've entered a different state of being. Maybe it's, you know, and even a contemporary story, you know, it could just be a kid who switches, goes to a new school and has experiences. Like I'm thinking of the wonderful book Wonder, mm-hmm. which is about a kid, you know, who has to go and face things. So you start in one place and then you have this long adventure in some other place. 
And then you've hopefully learned and grown and changed and have to confront some real transformation in yourself. And then the ending is the payoff of all of that, the testing and the resolution. So if you believe in story structure, as I do, that is often enough to organize my various wild creative impulses into a kind of shape. And that shape is usually enough for me. Usually it's enough for me to get going. I spent a few years studying and performing comedy improv. And I know from long experience that the ideas that you, you know, squeeze out laboriously and really kind of fret over are not nearly as good as the ideas that pop up and take you by surprise and kind of make you feel that the characters are writing the book. And I always like to leave space for that to happen. And if you over plan, you're not letting them you know, you're not giving them enough free reign. You sort of have to trust your characters and the work that you've done, in my opinion, to do that. So that's how I've approached. Having said that, there is a mystery at the heart of these books. And to begin a mystery without knowing, you know, pretty clearly what the resolution of that mystery is, is dangerous. (laughs) Right. So it's just sort of, you know, the winding path that you're going to take to get there may surprise you, but but you kind of know where you're going, right? But the fundamental questions of the Incorrigible Children series, who are the Incorrigible parents? Who put them in the woods? Why were they left there? To what end? And also, what happened to Penelope's parents? Because her parents dropped her off at her boarding school, the Swanburne Academy, when she was a little tiny girl and never came back to get her. Mm -hmm. And she never heard from them since. And so she, you know, she has a kind of a wound as well of sort of not knowing even if her parents are still alive. And if they are, why have they gone silent? And so she too has this mystery. So I had to know the fundamental answers to those questions and also maybe leave room for those answers to be refined. But I'll tell you, Sarah, I'm such a believer in just kind of riding the creative wave as opposed to trying to do some kind of top down, you know, engineering of a story that's that's not yet written, that in order to trick myself into knowing the answers to those questions, I wrote a story. When I was first planning the series before I'd sold it to HarperCollins or anything, I said, what if there was a scholar who was an expert on the strange case of the wolf children, you know, of Ashton Place? And what if he or she was giving a talk to an auditorium full of experts? And so I actually sat down with that little, you know, trick in my head and wrote the speech that this scholar gave. And it was through the writing of that speech that I was able to work out all of these answers because I wasn't thinking, I was just riffing, you know, I was improvising Interesting. and, and yeah. that myself into doing it. And when I teach writing, you know, I often, you know, encourage students and, you know, they get, they get blocked. They don't know what happens. It's like, you know, lighten up, you know, unclench your hands, unclench your mind and find, a, invent a game that you can play that is going to give you what you're looking for. You know, there are many ways to skin a cat. No offense to my cats. Uh, (laughs) You know, you're a creative person. If you're a writer, you're a creative person. So come up with a writing prompt that tricks you into solving your problem. So good. So interesting. I think it takes a lot of the weight too off of kids who, uh, we have a lot of kids in the Read Aloud Revival community who are aspiring writers and illustrators. And I think it takes the pressure off them feeling like they have to have all the answers and all the skills and everything worked out before they just sit down to play with the words or play with the illustrations. That's such a great point. And I think that it's very easy to mistake finished books, which we have all seen, right? We, our homes are filled mm-hmm. with finished books. The bookstores are filled. We, we see completed published books uh, in a hardcover all the time. And we think that that's what it is to write. But what we don't see is all the mess. And I always encourage people who are sort of stuck in that feeling that you have to know what you're going to say and write it perfectly, starting at the beginning and ending at the end, that the actual writing process is nothing like that. It's much more like the painter who fills, you know, dozens and dozens of sketchbooks playing with every little element that's going to end up in the finished painting. And then only after you've got all of these sketchbooks, do you get to say, oh, I like the dog facing this way rather than this way. And and I've done all of these color studies and I think I'm going to go in this direction. I mean, there's, you do a lot of playing. You have to make a lot of mud pies before you come up with anything that is remotely, you know, that looks like a finished book. But we as writers, we don't get to share that process as easily 
because a lot of it is in our heads or in our notebooks or in nowadays that so many of us work on computers, a lot of that playing gets absorbed, you know, Mm -hmm. into just the continual playing and revising on the screen. You know, we don't have some of us, some people do still write longhand. I don't, but we don't have rooms full of notebooks of all of our various sketches because a lot of it is just happening digitally. Well, this reminds me. So last week I talked to John Clausen because he actually, by the time this podcast airs, he will have just been on the Read Aloud Revival in Author Access, which we'll talk about in a little bit because you're going to be joining us there too, which is fantastic. Wonderful. I can't wait. Yes. And John showed me while we were doing kind of a tech check to make sure everything's going to work for the author event. He pulled up what he's working on now in Photoshop and all his layers and all his files. And he had, I don't remember how many dozens of like versions of the same picture. And he was kind of showing me how much he plays with it. What he was going to show us and what he'll have shown us by the time this episode airs on the Author Access event, he's going to share his screen and show the kids how many different ways he plays with a single drawing and how it doesn't need to be perfect. And he was talking to me about how we probably have this view of illustrators as they sit down and maybe it takes them a couple of tries, but they actually create one picture in its entirety on a single page when actually that's not at all how it works. Uh, They take, you know, a little piece from this and a little layer from that and they kind of mesh everything together. Just like you said, it's like a mud pie, a whole bunch of different mud pies. And then you get to take the best parts out and put them together. And it's a lot of playing around and a lot of fiddling and and then I thought I didn't even realize that John is the one who had illustrated your books until very recently. And I was completely thrown. I thought, oh, my goodness, how did I not realize this? It's completely his style. So, but So great. And it's exactly right. I'm so glad that John's going to share that work with your listeners because it's just so true. It's all process, as we say. And if you haven't had a lot of experience doing it, you don't know how much process is involved. You only see the finished product and you think, well, my job is to sit here in front of a blank page or a blank screen or a blank drawing pad and create a finished product. And that is the absolute worst thing that you can tell yourself. The finished product will come so much later, right? You know, you have to play. Now, John created the initial illustrations for the first few books in the series and the initial covers and was such an instrumental part of kind of creating this cool vibe about the way the books came out. And so it is a huge debt of gratitude to John. He's such a terrific illustrator. He is now so busy and series has gone on now to six books that I'm very happy to be working with a different illustrator, the later books in the series. And her name is Eliza Wheeler. Okay. And she is amazing as well. And so, you know, I feel like I hit the jackpot twice because they are two different artists who have two different, you know, sensibilities, but they have both captured something so special and right for the Incorrigible Children books. So, but if you look at the, like the original hardcovers of the first few books, you'll see that John did the covers and the interior illustrations of the books are John's and they're just delicious. I'm flipping through right now as you're talking. Sorry. (laughs) Tell me a little bit about working with an illustrator. A lot of times at our author events, the kids will ask the authors or illustrators, depending on who we have on, what their relationship is. Do you have insight or input, I guess is the word I'm looking for, into what the illustrations look like? Or is that completely separate from you? Well, I will answer for myself. This is not everyone's experience, but it has been my experience, uh, largely thanks to my very groovy editor at HarperCollins, uh, Donna Bray of the Balzer and Bray Imprint. It's been my experience that my opinion and ideas about what would make good illustrations and my feedback on the sketches, the many sketches that are created before the illustrations go to final has always been welcomed and I'm, it's always solicited and I've had, you know, the great pleasure of being able to give, you know, very specific ideas about what I think would work and, you know, catching, you know, sometimes even a little detail in an illustration that doesn't quite match what was in the draft, or maybe I've changed something, you know, since the illustration was sketched. Oh, they're supposed to be in sailor suits, or, you know, that's not the right kind of carriage that I was thinking (laughs) of. So those kinds of technical things are great to be able to catch and also creatively. So I have had, yeah, I've had plenty of input. That's not always the case. You know, when you're writing, um, you know, for one of the big publishers, the editor and the design staff in-house of the publisher sort of, you know, run that part of it. And different you know, different editors and 
writers have different kinds of relationships about this stuff. So it's not always the case that authors get to to meddle in that. But I'm very grateful that I have been able to. So what kinds of stories were your favorite to read with your own kids when they were younger? Well, let's see. (laughs) We, because I told you, my kids are now 18 and 21. So if you do the math, they were in that, my daughter, particularly my older child, was in that enchanted generation that was in the same age group as the Harry Potter characters. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) And and I I have to say, I I really wonder, with great hope and curiosity, how that age cohort is going to carry that experience into their adult lives. Because... When Harry Potter was 11, they were 11. And when he was 13, they were 13. And they had to wait a year or two years or three years for each new Harry Potter book to come out and read the series. It was as if it was about them. You know, Mm -hmm. it was such Mm -hmm. a personal experience. And anybody who who raised a kid during those years knows what I'm talking about. You know, go to the midnight launch party, wait for the next book to come out. It was just thrilling. So that was a really big part of, of our, you know, literary culture in my household. So the Harry Potter books were huge. And um, I'm pretty sure my daughter ta- sort of taught herself to read in order to be able to finish the first Harry Potter book. So I guess she's a little younger than Harry than the actual Harry kids. But I remember reading aloud to her and she just couldn't wait for me to do it. So she pl- plunged into a book that was, you know, a bit advanced for her at the time and, you know, got herself through it. I mentioned that my son was a big Curious George fan, also a big Calvin and Hobbes fan. Ah. Enough Another great relationship between a boy and an animal, you know, uh, this time the animal is externalized, right? So the boy is, has got his little pal. We read a lot together. I was always a big fan of sharing the classics. I felt like from the time they were infants, one of the great advantages of being a mother was that someday in the not too distant future, I would be able to read the Phantom Toll Booth aloud to somebody who <laughs> never read <it> before. <laughs> That's so great. Having kids right there, you know? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) My daughter and I read that together last year, and that was pretty delightful. There's a lot of classics that I think, as a parent, it's so much fun to say, I hadn't read The Phantom Tollbooth on my own before. And there are several classics that that's the case, where I hadn't read them. And I feel like it's a unique treat to be able to share that with my kids, to have that first experience with them. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of The Hobbit. Um, I would consider Charlotte's Web and The Hobbit my two, you know, perfect books, you know, my list of perfect books, books that you wouldn't change a word of, and that just get better. The more times you read them and the older you get, the better these books get. And to me, that's the mark of a true classic. So these are the books that were kicking around my house and, you know, whatever the kids were interested in. Have you seen Melissa Sweet's biography of E.B. White that just came out this last year, some writer. No, I haven't. I did hear about it. I'm going to uh, I'm going to have to add that to my to read list. Yes, she came on the podcast. I have to go look at which number episode it was. We'll put it in the show notes for you who are listening. If you missed it, she came on the podcast and talked about what it was like to write a biography of such a huge influential person in history that has shaped children's literature and fiction. And it's just that I fell in love with the book. It's yeah, completely delightful. It's called Some Writer, The Story of E.B. White. And if you're listening and you haven't seen the book yet, we'll put that link in the show notes as well. Oh, fantastic. I want to read it too. <laughs> okay, so I didn't ask you this ahead of time, but do you have a copy of one of your books that you could read a little bit for us from? Would that be okay? It would be okay, but you have to let me get a book close at hand. Oh, yeah. I, take your time. Let's see. All right, let me go grab one. All righty. I have located a copy of The Mysterious Howling. Perfect. The first book in the series. And why don't I read a little bit from the scene where Penelope meets the incorrigible children for the first time? Wonderful. By way of setting up the scene, I will say that she's been offered and and accepted the job as governess at Aston Play. She doesn't know anything about the children just yet. And she's been shown to her beautiful new room that will be her home. And Remember that she, you know, grew up in a dormitory, sleeping two girls to a cot at her Swanburn Academy. So it's quite luxurious. And she's unpacking her things. It's mostly books and very few dresses. But she's unpacking her things when she hears this howling sound coming in the windows. And it's really a tugs at her heart because she's very tenderhearted about animals. And she runs outside to see what it is. She assumes it must be some wounded dogs 
It sounds like it's coming from the barn. And um, she dashes out, and Mrs. Clark, the housekeeper, chases after her, tries in several ways to prevent her from arriving at the barn, but fails. And they get to the barn door, and they hear this sound. Oh! 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 Without further discussion, Penelope shoved the distraught housekeeper aside leaned her full weight against the great wooden doors and pushed them open. As the sunlight flooded the dark interior, the howling abruptly stopped. Penelope looked around. The barn smelled strongly of leather and hay, but the stalls, at least those she could see, were empty. The sudden silence was broken only by the panting of Mrs. Clark, who stood silhouetted in the doorway, clutching her voluminous bosom. Hello? Penelope said in a soft, soothing tone. Oh, you unfortunate creatures, are you all right? Slowly, noiselessly, something moved inside the barn. Three sets of eyes glinted from the dark corners of the rearmost stalls where the sun did not reach. Come here. Penelope wished she had thought to bring some scraps of meat with her to lure the poor frightened things. Come out where I can see you. The creatures obeyed. They were not dogs or ponies or any other kind of four-legged animal. They were three children, and they stared at Penelope with the shining, watchful eyes of wild things. All three were wrapped in coarse saddle blankets, but wore no other clothing, not even shoes. Their hair was long and tangled and of the same distinctive auburn color, which marked them unmistakably as siblings. They were a boy, whom Penelope guessed to be in the vicinity of ten, another boy, of a size and age approximately three years younger than the first, and a little girl, no more than four or five. Well, hello, Penelope said again, even more gently, to hide her astonishment. One of the children, it was impossible to tell which one, let out a low growl. Mrs. Clark gasped, but Penelope paid her no mind. It is a pleasure to meet you, she said to the children, with all the professionalism she could muster. I am Miss Lumley, your new governess. There you go. I could listen to you read the entire thing. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Oh, that is so much fun. And the accent is just perfection. (laughs) (laughs) Now you all want to go and grab the book, right? And you should, because the whole series is fantastic. Books one through five are available now. And book six comes out in August. Is that right? That is correct. It's called The Long Lost Home. The Long Lost Home, the final installment in the series about the incorrigible children of Ashton Place. I cannot wait to get my hands on it. Mary Rose, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a complete treat. For me too. Thank you so much for having me. I really have enjoyed our conversation. Now for our listeners who'd like to connect with you further, where should they go to do that best? They can find me on my website, which is www.maryrosewood.com. Now it's time for Let the Kids Speak. This is my favorite part of the podcast, where kids tell us about their favorite stories that have been read aloud to them. My name is Frances, and I'm nine years old. I live in Minnesota, and my favorite book is Ember Falls because it's uh, fun to listen, and they have a lot of epic battles. My name is Kate. I am 13 years old. I live in Anoka, Minnesota, and my favorite book is Anna Green Gables because it tells how people used to live a long time ago. Hi, my name is Isaac Riondo. I live in Anoka, Minnesota. I'm 10 years old, and my favorite book is Redwall. I like how funny he Mephias acts and, and... Like all the action and those stories that the Abbey tells him. My name is Greg Lee, and and I'm six years old, and I live in Minnesota, and my favorite book is Green Eggs and Ham. I like it because there's a train. My name is Joseph, and my age is four, and my favorite book is Fox in the Socks. 
fox and my in it because there's a fox in it and my river in Minnesota. My name is Thomas and I'm eight years old and I live in Minnesota and my favorite book is, is Green Eggs and Ham and my favorite part about it is Eli Mean Funny Things. My name is Casey, I'm from Maryland. My favorite book is The Baking Boo Boo and my favorite part of it is when, when Rhythm had a great idea that they two is wrong, can we make a pig? What's your name? Henry. Henry. How old are you? Four. And what's your favorite book? The blue truck. The little blue truck? What do you like about that? Stinky and dirty. And you also like stinky and dirty. That's right. Yes, you do. Hi, my name is Penny and I am five years old and I live in Indiana and I'm going to tell you about Peter Pan. I like the part when um, Peter Pan won't I'm so windy how to fly. Hi, my name is Nora, and I am seven years old, and I live in Indiana. And my favorite book is Heidi, because she has a friend named Clara, and she has a broken leg, and she goes to the mountain to see Heidi, and then she feels better. Wonderful. I love hearing those so very much. Wasn't that episode fun? Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey, remember that your kids can meet Mary Rosewood live on video in Read Aloud Revival membership later this year, along with other amazing authors and illustrators like Tommy DePaula, Grace Lynn, Andrew Peterson, Jane Yolen. You want to join Read Aloud Revival membership when we open up the doors for registration next month. Head to rarmembership.com to be the first to know when those doors open. And we'll be back in two weeks here on the podcast with another great episode for you. Until then, friends, go build your family culture around books. 